I'd like to welcome all of you to the weekly meeting of the college complex this playground for people who think. We have two rooms here, no personal attacks, and one school at a time. We have several policies and procedures here. First of all, the $3 tuition charge will be collected from everybody for the college raise expenses. Secondly, we want to continue to be able to meet here, and the restaurant is not in business for itself. Everyone who's here in the restaurant is going to be is going to need to either order dinner or something else to eat or drink. All right. Our, our program is as follows. First, in a moment, Sarah Kadak, our coordinator, is going to announce the upcoming programs. And anyone else who has program who has announcements of neighborhood or community interest may make them. Announcements only during that part. No speeches. And I will introduce the speaker of the evening who talk about the topic for about an hour or so. Then we will entertain questions and answers. Questions, this is like Jeopardy. Questions must be in that form. Speakers come in the next segment to rebuttals. Then our moderator will portion out the time and everybody can talk for whatever time it is, three minutes, five minutes, whatever it is, uh, for, for either we will talk the speaker or talk about whatever else they want to talk about in the amount of time. And the speaker will get the last word. And we're going to close the shop at about a quarter to eight. All right. Any questions? Hearing none. All right, Charlie, go ahead. All right. Welcome, everyone, to meeting number 3,716 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, as usual, I want to remind you that we have a Google and a meetup email groups, which I recommend you subscribe to, and you get one or two notices at most no traffic on upcoming programs on Saturday each week. So sign up for either one of those. Again, uh, I would have to ask everyone in the restaurant to please contain your conversation, at least during the presentation, because the microphone picks it up. And everyone at home, please put a big red X over your microphone on the lower left of your Zoom picture, lower left during the presentation, so as not to disturb the speaker. We want to hear what Marilyn has to say tonight. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. We've got seven on the schedule right now. On, um, May the 22nd, our own Jonathan, uh, pardon, college regular, is going to talk about war, crim war criminals. He wants to bring people before a tribunal such as the International Criminal Court. So May 22nd, more crimes. June 27th, another college regular, Mike Lehman, is going to take us on a ride on high-speed trains. Uh, he's an expert on railroading. So we're going to learn about passenger train travel. Uh, he, he was uh, to the continent. So he's got a, he says he's got 100 slides on uh, high-speed rail travel uh, stations. And so, uh, tra transitioning into June, uh, we're going to look at the climate movements, violent and nonviolent. This my gentleman is an official with um, climate organization and wrote a book as well. So we're going to be discussing uh, we? movement, the movement uh, to, uh, Raj, please put an X on your microphone. Everyone, red X right now uh, for your microphone. Thank you. June the three is climate movements, violent and nonviolent. Will this movement turn violent? Uh, June the 10th, uh, our own uh, Henry uh, Kowalczyk, he's an author of, and a blog, several articles. He's looked at the Ukraine in detail. So we're going to visit this very important timely issue, the conflict in the Ukraine. June the 17th, uh, Andy Anderson, he's been researching the topic for decades. It's going to talk about censored subjects. What's what you what they don't want you to know about? 
So June 17th, censored subjects. On the 24th, we return again to the topic of global warming. We have a biological evolutionist, an academic with significant credentials internationally uh, yeah, on the topic. So global warming, June 24th. <laughs> there are four dates open in July. And on July 8th, we are going to be visited by no one other than George Washington himself. George Washington is coming to, to the College of Complexes. I want to ask him if he really told the truth about chopping down the cherry tree. Is that just some story, a campaign story? Did he really fess up? I don't think so. But anyhow, we are in fact having George Washington at the College of Complexes. Oh, okay, so that's about it. Just one last thing. We made two, two archival sites on our website with a lecture library, of course, with over 100 to 200 videotapes and lectures, which Tim has worked assiduously on. We also have another site with free films on the internet that have been recommended, as well as the PowerPoint presentation of our presenter. The PowerPoint presentations uh, are posted there as well. So that's it. Thank you very much. Take it away. Okay. Okay. Any other announcements of community and member of community interest? Hearing none, one more announcement from me. Please turn off all silence, all cell phones in the lower left. We'll have the presentation muted during Maryland's part. Yes. We'll, mute, we'll mute the restaurant here in case we need to open up. All right. All right, Marilyn, the floor is yours. Right. Let's yeah. welcome our speaker, Marilyn, for uh... welcome, Marilyn. all right. Welcome, all right, so go ahead, Marilyn, you, the floor is yours. Okay, good evening. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, if you hear a howling in the background, let me know. My cat is not always attentive like it should be. Oh, let's... So, um... Well, tonight's discussion is based on the idea of economic, demo economic democracy as a measure of freedom. That is the idea that as citizens, we have political freedom and majority rule is guaranteed in our constitution, but that as employees, we do not have those same rights within our economic institutions nor do we have the economic freedom to reap as we sow. Without both freedoms, economic as well as political, we cannot survive as a people and as a nation. It is economic freedom that we will address tonight. Last year, the United States produced the equivalent of 300,000 for every family of four. Think about it, 300,000 for every family of four in one year. Why then do we still have 43 million people living in poverty? Why do we have a middle class that is sliding toward poverty in spite of being educated? Economic democracy and would answer that both the poor and the middle class are not being paid 100% of what they have rightfully earned. This happens in various ways. To explore these ways further, let us first look at them in the larger context of power. In 1887, the noted English historian, Lord Acton observed that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is generally proven to be true, whether the power resides in the hands of corporate elitists through laissez-faire capitalism, as in the Western world, or bureaucratic elitists who attain power through governmental socialism, as in China. In neither case is political power 
and economic wealth spread out amongst we the people. In a political autocracy, we see a concentration of political power. In an economic autocracy, we see a concentration of economic power. In the end, neither one is sustainable because people will not and cannot support them, as can be seen in the long history of the rise and fall of nations. A nation of poor people has neither the desire nor the strength to sustain that nation. Presently, the US is in the hypocritical position of preaching political freedom to the rest of the world while maintaining autocratic economic institutions that concentrate economic power into the hands of the few. As economic power becomes more and more concentrated, it erodes political freedom. According to Freedom House, an organization that rates freedom in 195 countries, 105 countries have seen a net decline in political freedom during the past 10 years, and only 43 have seen an improvement. During the same 10 year period, wealth inequality has continued to grow. In my view, this is no coincidence that political freedom has diminished as wealth inequality has risen. Freedom House also attributes the decline in political freedom to economic downturns, plus the problems of mass migrations. The mass migrations themselves are frequently related to hard economic conditions. For instance, according to the New York Times, an extremely severe drought in Syria from 2006 to 2009 created food shortages that contributed to the uprising that began in 2011. It is clear that we must find another way, a transformational form of political and economic democracy that empowers all of us. When power is spread out, no one person or business or institution can unfairly overwhelm another person or business or institution. Our fa founding fathers established a division of powers politically with majority rule by the people as the base of that power, but they did not address a division of power economically nor did they provide for majority rule within major economic structures. Because of this, we are now faced with pools of wealth run by the few and that have enough power to overwhelm our political democracy. In effect, we have an economic autocracy that has the power to destroy our political democracy. Great concentration. If you were ever thinking about joining the army, don't fucking do it. You're dying for a country that lets in the enemy anyway. You're dying for a country that doesn't appreciate you. You're dying for a country that makes your team weak as fuck and it would rather virtue signal and look good and look nice than it would actually train an effective fighting force. Fuck that garbage. Great concentration of power is based on great concentration of wealth. The more the power money concentrates, the more the power concentrates. It is the power to buy the politicians who make laws in favor of concentrated wealth. It is the power to buy the bureaucrats who administer those purchase laws. And it is the power to buy the judges who force obedience to those purchase laws. Therefore, it logically follows that in order to decentralize power, we have to decentralize wealth. If we were to decentralize wealth, we would have a standard of living beyond our fondest dreams. When we consider that in one year, our society produced the equivalent of 300,000 for every family of four, 
we know that poverty and a declining middle class are not a matter of making a product or providing a service. It is instead a problem of how employees are paid for making those products and providing those services. Imagine how many of our society's problems would be eliminated if 300,000 for a family of four were a benchmark average. Of course, in a merit-based society, some would be below the norm and some above, but clearly- Only a cat-owning bitch would complain to the police about a fucking joke. Fine, you're upset you lost your cat. Fair enough, yeah, the joke may have been a little bit, you know, risque. Who calls the police on a fucking joke? Cat owners. Cat owners are liberals. Cat owners believe in hate speech. Cat owners are Democrats. Cat owners are dickheads. Of course, in a merit-based society, some would be below the norm and some above, but clearly we would all be much better off if the bar for average income per family were 300,000 instead of the present median of only 70,000. Poverty, with all of its many problems, would no longer exist, and the middle class would include all of us in far greater prosperity and security than we now enjoy. So the question is, how can we decentralize wealth in a fair- Therapists don't want you to get better. Therapists want little piles of goo they can poke at, little weak individuals they can just poke at and ask stupid questions to. We're gonna pay an hourly rate forever. Would you care to listen and then talk? Or do you wanna have the, the, the stage? I just booted them out. Okay. Sorry about that. I, uh, uh, you know. That's Why right. are you keep letting him in? I didn't let him in. I, I didn't know who it was at first. Now I got it. So my apologies, please. Uh, go ahead, um, go ahead, uh, Marilyn. My apologies, please. That shouldn't happen again. Okay. I am we're trying. I'm sorry about the trouble. That's a, okay. Yeah, I know it's hard. Has he been here before? I Andrew Tate's been here before, but I guess he wasn't willing to uh, go by the rules. It just, it just you have to. <laughs> Sometimes Andrew Tate is a troll. Uh, a troll. I mean, <clears throat> he, okay. he's known in other meetings. All right. So, all right. Well, thank you very much, Jacob. All right. Well, we'll we won't let him in then. Uh, can, please continue. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. Poverty with all its many pro. Okay. So the question is, how can we decentralize wealth? in a fair and moral way? For the answer, we have to look at the three basic ways that wealth can be centralized into the hands of the few. All three of these ways are what could be called legalized something for nothing schemes or institutions. In other words, they legally allow people who make nothing and do nothing to take units of work from the national storehouse of goods without bringing any units of work in return. Naturally, that means more work and less goods for all the people who do work to make actual goods and provide actual services. To better visualize how this occurs, Imagine for a moment a barter economy where there is no money. It is that easy to see how the farmer must trade his grain for cloth and the weaver must trade his cloth for grain. It is a direct transaction between farmer and weaver and they exchange equal units of work. It is also important to note that they receive 100% of the fruits of their labor. In modern terms, that would be employees receiving 100% of the profit for their work. But when money enters the picture, it is all too easy for this basic relationship to be obscured. Money is merely a medium of exchange that represents an actual bushel of grain or bolt of cloth and nothing more. Unfortunately, 
We lose sight of the fact that money is only a paper symbol and is not real food and not real cloth. As a result, we who work allow ourselves to be conned into taking money from non-workers and think we have created units of work one for one, but we haven't. We have received a unit of work, but not from the non-worker who gave us the money. The non-worker legally scammed the unit of work from a worker and then gave us the scammed unit of work. So now the non-worker possesses a unit of work, we possess a scammed unit of work, and the other worker has nothing. He has to go on government welfare and then gets blamed for being forced onto welfare. Were there no money involved, we could easily see that the non-workers are giving us nothing in exchange for the food, clothing, and shelter that we have unwittingly given to them. So now we come to the crucial question, what are the institutions that allow non-workers to live off of those who do work? The answer to that question lies at the heart of economic freedom. But what exactly is economic freedom? We say we have it, but do we really? The essence of economic freedom is the right of all producers to receive 100% of the fruit of their labors. That is to say, 100% of the profit or benefit. Presently, that is not the case. We have three legal institutions that dispossess employees and other producers of their rightful earnings and funnel that dispossessed money to the few at the top. It is these something for nothing institutions that create wealth inequality. What are these institutions? They are corporate profit skimming, land speculation, and inheritance. These are the three basic ways that people who do no work can legally scam the people who do work. Therefore, it is these three institutions that must be reformed if we are to reverse the concentration of wealth. So let's look now at how these three something for nothing institutions concentrate wealth at the top and how to reform them in order to provide economic justice and wealth for all. The first institution is the autocratic top-down corporate structure that has the power to take however much it wants of the profits that employees create. To counteract that power, unions have struggled for the last several centuries to take some of that control, but it's been an ongoing dogfight, patchwork at best, with no central underlying moral principle as to who deserves what power and what money. As a result, wealth has continued to centralize overall during the last several centuries, no matter how strong or how weak the unions were. In order to stop the concentration of wealth, and along with it establish labor management peace, we need to look at underlying moral principles. The first moral principle is to separate the concepts of work and money. Work is not money, and money is not work. Money is paper. Work is energy expended by living human beings without which we would have nothing. Living human beings are not human capital to be lumped into the same inanimate category as bricks and mortar and money and disposed of at will. The very phrase human capital is dehumanizing. It turns people into objects. It is morally repugnant. As oh, objects, shit. employees have no power and no constitutional rights in the workplace and no rights to the property that they have created through their work. They are, in effect, serfs within the corporate institution. Yes, they have the freedom to walk away, but where would they go? 
Their only choice is to starve or go work for another corporate institution where the rules are the same. When we separate work and investment money, we can see that in basic terms, investors are simply money lenders who loan money to employees to pay for tools and a building. That's it, really nothing much more. Are the lenders providing any work, any human energy to produce the widget? No, they're simply loaning money. As such, the loan of money is a service and should receive interest in return for that service. In other areas of commerce, loans receive interest. The loan on your house, the loan on your car, you pay interest. If you were to go to a bank, to get a loan for a truck to start a food catering business, what would you expect to pay on the loan? Interest and nothing more. Would you expect to hand over all the profits and all control of your business forever to the bank that loaned you money for the truck? Of course not. Then why do we expect workers to accept such serfdom? Whether it's small scale, our large scale, the underlying principle is the same. Loan is a loan is a loan, whether to an individual or to a corporation. That or a loan is entitled to draw interest and nothing more. The rate of interest on the loan should be based on the risk assessment of each individual or enterprise as established in open market competition. At least once a year, there should be a reassessment of the current risk and corresponding rate of interest, again determined in open market competition. It is essential that all new capital expansion be based on loans. Excuse me, can you tell me when this is going to end? Costs belongs can you tell to me how long more? There is nothing more. Of course, employees... With your are lecture, is there any... What time does it end? Just let me know. Of course, employees on their own. Five minutes, 10 minutes. Hello, talking to you. How long? Uh, 30 more? to 45, Jacob. She does. Stop, stop interrupting. Till what time? Stop interrupting. Till uh, what time? You about, shut up, lady. Oh, you shut up. I'm Jacob. asking a question to the speaker. You have I'm not asking how much more time. Jacob, you have not interrupt during the speech. Lady. No. Keep your mouth like shut. I'm not talking no. to you. I'm talking to the speaker. And I'm not talking to you. I would I'm just, like to know I'm just how long telling more. you. All right. Mm -hmm. You shut up and don't uh, interrupt. Uh, employees on their own are free to buy into their how company's long? loans, just as they are free to buy into any other company's loans. If employees are proud and confident in their own organization, they will offer loan money at low interest. Jesus Christ. Most likely would be a mark of pride as well as a mark of security to have a large percent of the stock employee owned. The second underlying moral principle is to bring democracy to the workplace. Private enterprise is only private when it involves a family size business of 10 or less people. But when you have businesses that employ hundreds or thousands of workers, that has a huge impact on the community as a whole. That's no longer private family and friends. That's involving a major part of the public as employees and as consumers. In effect, bigger companies become a public business that affects and often rules the entire community. In addition, corporations must observe democratic principles in the workplace in order for its employees to enjoy the political freedom and liberties guaranteed in our constitution. That means majority rule within the company. That means at the very minimum, that employees would vote on their choice of leaders within the company. Employees would vote on major policy decisions and that nobody would be fired except by a two thirds vote of those who know the employee's work record. Does that sound radical? On the contrary, it's realistic because it does work. 
It has been phenomenally successful at Lincoln Electric. Once on the verge of bankruptcy, Lincoln Electric survived the Great Depression and became one of the foremost arc welding companies in the world through highly incentivized employees who earn on average double what workers in other similar companies earn and who have a real voice in company policy. At the same time the workers are earning more, they are still able to lower the price of their product through savings and efficiencies suggested by all of the employees themselves. Anyone can walk into the president's office, which by the way, has no fancy furniture. There's no special parking spots and everyone enters and leaves through the front door. It is also interesting to consider that even though Lincoln Electric is located in Cleveland, Ohio, the heart of the Rust Belt, this company has not only survived, but it and its workers have thrived. If you would like to learn more about this great company and moral profit sharing, you can read the book, Incentive Management by James F. Lincoln. The same spirit of moral profit sharing and democratic control has propelled public supermarkets in Florida and John Lewis department stores in the UK to similar success. It's worth noting that John Lewis was started in 1864, Lincoln Electric in the 1890s, and Publix in 1930. These companies have proven their staying power and have grown even in the worst of times. They made it through two world wars and the Great Depression. And during the Great Recession of 2008, while America as a whole was losing millions of jobs, employee-owned firms actually increased jobs by 2%. These companies endure because their employees have the incentive to succeed and the control they need in order to be successful and to stay in business. Since employees make the decisions, they do not have to fear that big investors and Wall Street will buy the company out from under them and loot the company and downgrade or destroy their jobs. Since it is the employees who make the decisions, they do not have to fear being offshored for cheaper labor in a third world country. Many co-ops, such as the giant Mondragon in Spain and the Alvarado Street Bakery in California, further illustrate what is possible when 100% of the profit goes to those who create the profit and democratic control goes to those who know the business best, the employees. At the Alvarado Street Bakery, a high school graduate on the assembly line earns 60,000 a year plus profit sharing, plus great health insurance, plus a 401k. So it's a myth that higher education is the sole path out of poverty. The path out of poverty is to pay people 100% of what they have rightfully earned. That's not to say that higher education isn't of value for other reasons, it is, but honest labor of any sort deserves honest pay. From dishwashing to assembly line to research and development, workers are morally entitled to a 100% return on their labor minus expenses. Pay the interest on the loans, pay the operating expenses, and then return the rest to the workers who earned it. That is economic freedom. The above examples of moral profit sharing and democratic control prove that economic justice and democratic principles applied to the business world work much better than profit skimming and its corollary top-down autocracy. In a democratic corporation, employees are motivated to produce the best product possible at the lowest price possible because they have a real stake 
in how well the company does. Personal survival is tied to company survival. Plus, it removes a lot of personal employee stress. Employees don't have to worry about being laid off or the company being taken over by hostile investors or their retirement benefits being wiped out. That's because the employees have control over those decisions, not Wall Street investors who care only about money. In democratic corporations, employees can exercise their constitutional right to freedom of speech. They can speak up without being fired by a capricious, all-powerful boss. When workplace conditions are dangerous, employees themselves will have the power to correct those dangerous conditions. No longer will employees die in early death because they are forced to endure chemical contamination and unsafe machinery in the name of profit. Right now, we have an immoral situation in which the people who suffer the abuses of corporate autocracy, the employees, do not have a legal right to save their lives by correcting those abuses through their own actions. That is because employees do not have a legal right to democratic decision-making, just as they do not have a legal right to 100% of the profit that they create. If the Constitution has any meaning at all, the right to life through safe working conditions, the right to liberty through democratic decision-making, and the protection of employee-created property must be extended to employees in the workplace. To do otherwise is to violate our constitutional rights. As mentioned above, enterprises with less than 10 people would be the exception to the rule in order to encourage the initiative of small entrepreneurs and inventors. Some people work best at a smaller, more individual level. But once a company grows beyond 10 people, it has changed from an individual enterprise to a cooperative enterprise. The enterprise is no longer a one-man show. How many cars could Ford have made working by himself in his garage? How many light bulbs could Thomas Edison have made on his own in his garage? How many computers could Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak have cranked out by hand in their garage? Growth comes from all the employees combining their various talents in a cooperative effort. The skill set of an inventor or entrepreneur is usually quite different from the skill set of company employees. Each personality type needs the other to make a successful business. Economic freedom in corporations will benefit not only the employees, but it will benefit the lenders as well. The principal and interest of lenders is more secure because employee controlled companies are more stable, long lasting and high performing. Employees would have the option of establishing a depreciation fund to secure the principal of the lenders, which would provide greater security on the loan for lenders and a lower and lower the interest rate for employees to pay. Investing will no longer be, as John Beasley has pointed out, a risky gamble in the Wall Street casino. Instead, it will be a steady business in a steady community based on honest work and honest reward for that work. This leads us to other community benefits. One of the greatest benefits is that the bloated, oversized conglomerates that dominate the market and our politics will disappear. Banks too big to fail, big drug companies hiking drug prices at will, huge manufacturers and big box retailers driving small competitors out of business. All of this will disappear. Why? Because both the incentive and the money to merge will disappear. First, 
the incentive will disappear because employees will not want to grow big beyond the point of diminishing marginal returns, since that means they will be working for less and less reward. Who in their right mind would do that? Right now, investors and Wall Street don't care because they're not the ones exerting the effort. If the inefficiencies of diminishing returns adds another two cents to the bottom line on the quarterly report, that's fine with them. They could care less that employees are spinning their wheels. Second, there would be no money gain in buying another company because 100% of earnings would be going to the employees of the second company, not to the profit skimmers. Third, the money to swallow up other companies will be gone because all of that money will have been dispersed among the employees who earned it. No longer will it be legal to scam the profits that employees work to create and use that scammed profit to buy up other companies in order to scam yet more profit from yet more employees. In addition to the above, banks and any institutions that loan other people's money should make service charges only. All interest should be apportioned among those whose money is used. In this way, we who deposit money in a bank will receive 100% of the interest that our money has earned. Imagine that. As I'm sure everyone in this room is aware, ever since the Great Recession, banks have gotten away with paying a fraction of 1% in interest to depositors, while at the same time, typically charging 3% or more for mortgages and 10% or more for charge cards. So we the people watch what little savings we have disappear through inflation. It's either that or take a gamble in the Wall Street gambling casino. Hmm, wait a minute. Wasn't that what wiped out the savings of many seniors and is now forcing them either into poverty or to work until they drop? With the incentive and money for mergers gone, we will have the benefit of many small companies competing in a true open market. This competition will bring about better products at better prices an obvious win for the consumer. Employee profit sharing and employee control stabilize companies and therefore stabilize communities. Stabilized companies will also provide lenders with a stable source of interest income. So corporate democracy through economic freedom is a triple win. A win for employees, a win for lenders, and a win for society as a whole. The loans that provide money to companies will also help stabilize our entire monetary system. These loans, in effect, will be bonds based on the fixed capital goods of tools and buildings. Since the value of these tools and buildings will be expressed in dollars, the long-term value of the dollar will thus be stabilized. After all, the value of money should be based on the value of real capital goods and services. Consequently, the more stable is this base of real value, the more stable is money. To sum it up, the essence of economic serfdom is giving up units of work without receiving equal units of work in return. Think about it. The only reason personal servitude has existed down through the ages was to force those who work to hand over the fruits of their labor to someone else. In the old days, it was done at source point. Today, it is done by legally sanctioned corporate skimming. This corporate skimming has been made legal because of laws that are bought and paid for by big money. When employees are freed of this corporate scam, they will have attained real economic freedom, that is, the freedom to keep what is morally theirs, 100% return for their efforts, plus democratic governance of the workplace. As John Hamaker said, in this way, we gain security for the company, 
wealth and freedom for its employees, and a dearth of gambling material for the sharp cookies to play with. A little justice goes a long way. Okay, uh, now we come to the second institution that, sent, that concentrates wealth at the top. <laughs> that second institution is land speculation. It's pretty simple. Mr. A buys some cheap land on the outskirts of town and then waits for the town to build up around his land. As the town grows, the value of his land rises. After 10 or 20 years, he sells the land for much more than he paid. Where's the scam, you may ask? The scam is contained in these two questions. First, whose work created the land? And second, whose work raised the value of the land? Well, the answer to the first question <clears throat> is that no human made the land. The creator did the work and made the land, not Mr. A. And the answer to the second question is that the value of Mr. A's land was raised through the efforts of the hardworking citizens of the town who worked to build up and expand the town. Mr. A did not have to lift a finger. He did not have to exert one iota of effort. In answer to both questions, <clears throat> we find that Mr. A did not work to create the land and he did not work to increase the value of the land. Like the gamblers on Wall Street or in Las Vegas, he won the jackpot without making anything of value to society. He did nothing. Instead, he took units of work from the National Storehouse of Goods without bringing any units of work in return. What does that mean for us who do work? To begin with, of course, it means that we must work extra hours to supply the non-working Mr. A with food, clothing, and shelter without receiving any food, clothing, or shelter in return. Yes, Mr. A pays his money, but that money is meaningless because his money is not backed by any real goods or services that Mr. A has produced. In actuality, we're getting goods and services that were made by others, not Mr. A. Why do we need Mr. A in the middle of the transaction? We don't, because in essence, he is getting a third party cut without having made anything of value to exchange. So you and I have to work double time, growing food, making clothing, building shelter for the land speculator who makes nothing in return. Excuse me a minute. Another negative consequence is that the harder we work to build a town, the more the land value rises. The more the land value rises, the more we have to pay Mr. A. In effect, we're working to our detriment. The harder we work, the more we have to pay the non-worker. It's the same principle as presently exists in most corporations. The harder we work, the more we make money for somebody else. How is that fair or just? Where is the incentive for those who work? Is it any wonder that the work ethic is disappearing from our society? So what is the solution? In the first place, since no human worked to create the land, the water, and the air, what right does any one human have to claim ownership? Have you ever seen a baby born with a property ID divinely stamped on his forehead? Secondly, since it is the work of the townspeople that creates the rise in land values, should not the townspeople receive the value 
of that property rise? For the answer as to how to morally allocate land, we can turn to Henry George and his book, Progress and Poverty, published in 1879. It was read by an estimated 2 million readers and its principles were endorsed by Albert Einstein, Helen Keller, Leo Tolstoy, Sun Yat-sen, Nicholas Murray Butler, Louis Brandeis, John Kieran, George Bernard Shaw, Woodrow Wilson, and many other notable thinkers. Unfortunately, like Nikola Tesla, Henry George is largely forgotten today. But unlike Tesla, whose inventions have been recognized in the use of alternating electrical current, Henry George's groundbreaking ideas in the economic realm have yet to be instituted. That's typical of the overall societal pattern of the last several hundred years. Great scientific progress, but socioeconomic progress, not so much. In his book, Henry George makes a distinction between two types of property, land, which no man works to create, and the houses, garages, barns, and other property on the land, which man does work to create. We see that distinction in our property tax statements. Land has X value and our house has a separate Y value. Therefore, it is right that we should individually own that which our work creates, the house and the garage. But we did not create the land. It was put here for all. And the Therefore, it is the community that should reap the reward of that higher value. Money put into the community pot goes for the good of all, schools, roads, policemen, firemen, etc. Buying and selling land eventually shuts out most of us. Instead of buying and selling, we should bid in the open market for individual land holding grants that would be ours to use as we wish, so long as we pay the annual use tax on the land, which is similar to the property taxes we already pay. As grant holders, we would still individually manage and control our land the same way we do now. The government would have no more control over the use of our land than it has now. The only thing that changes is the added advantage that we would no longer have to come up with money to buy land. Think how much less expensive your mortgage would be if it did not, not include the cost of land. In most cases, the mortgage would be at least a third cheaper than at present, if not more. Half of Dallas residents are renters. How many more renters could realize the American dream and become homeowners if the mortgage were a third cheaper? The mortgage would be on the house only, not on the land. Same thing is true in Chicago and Minneapolis, wherever we happen to be. Many more residents, city residents, could own a home. Under land grants, the land tax would operate much the same as the present property tax on land. In fact, the land tax might actually be lower than your present property tax for two reasons. First, there would be no tax at all on your house, outbuildings, and other improvements that are the result of human work. Henry George did not believe that productive work should be taxed since that discourages productive work. Secondly, the value of the land would lie only in what it could be used for. The speculation value would be gone. One of the reasons that land is presently so expensive is because it too has become part of the gambling casino through speculation. Take the gambling aspect out of land and it becomes 
just another tool with which to provide food, clothing, and shelter. Under land grants, many more people would have affordable access to land than they do at present. History has given us a great example of what people can accomplish when they have affordable access to land. That example is our pioneer forefathers. Many of them came to this country because they were impoverished peasants in Europe with no land, no hope. They fled to America where land was made available to them for the settling. With little more than a plow and a horse, they were able to provide food and shelter for their families. They were able to build a future and become proud independent citizens. Perhaps it was this example that inspired Daniel Defoe to write Robinson Crusoe in 1719. Again, it clearly shows how one man with a few rudimentary tools was able to provide for himself in abundance when given access to land and no overlord to demand part of his work. This brings us to another beneficial aspect of land holding grants in lieu of land speculation. In the last 100 years, the world has seen a mass migration from the country to the city. Right now, only 2% of people in the US live on farms. The small farmer has all but disappeared. The average size of a farm is over a thousand acres. Almost 40% of farmland is rented. Is this a good thing? Well, large farms and tenant operated farms tend to focus on profit, not food quality. They don't pull weeds by hand or kill crop bugs in ecological, environmentally safe ways. They pour half a billion pounds, half a billion pounds of herbicides and pesticides on our food a year. And of course we eat those plant GMO seeds and use acidic NPK fertilizer with little or no concern for all the trace element minerals that humans need for a healthy life. The result is a steady rise in degenerative diseases. For example, one out of three of us now get cancer. That's over 100 million people in the US alone. In addition, animals are raised in inhumane and unsanitary conditions. That means terrible suffering for the animals and illness and sometimes death for humans from E. coli, food poisoning, and the long-term effects of the antibiotics and hormones fed to animals and passed on to us. The small farmer has an interest in taking care of his land and animals in a sustainable way because it is both his livelihood and his life. However, when big money bids up the price of land, the small farmer can't compete and is driven off the land. Take away the high cost of buying land and individuals would once again have easier access to land for individual use. This would include not only individuals who wish to farm, but also those who wish to establish homes and businesses in both urban and rural communities. When inexpensive rural land is available, a group of employees might well decide they would rather establish their work location away from cities and a wasteful two hour commute. With land available for small farms and businesses, small towns in America could enjoy a revival. This would help large towns that would be relieved of the constant pressure and expense to expand city services, build infrastructure for the present influx of refugees from impoverished rural areas and rust belts. In summation, land is here for the use of all. No one individual has an inherent right to claim land because no individual worked to create it. It is society as a whole that puts a value on land. So it is society as a whole that should benefit from that value 
through a land tax that would operate much the same as present land taxes. The amount of the land tax would be established for each parcel on the basis of bidding in the open market. Upon the death of the last surviving partner in a marriage or partnership, the land would again be put up for bid in the open market. Thus, land would be available to all in each succeeding generation. In the 19th century, affordable access to land was a key factor in building our national economy. In the 21st century, providing that same affordable access to land again could help rebuild our national economy. Marilyn, would you be able to wrap up in about 10 minutes or so? Uh, Maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, I'll try because we want to get a lot of time for questions and rebuttals, okay? That's all. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, the third something for nothing institution that creates wealth at the top. Inherited wealth is the third way that a person can spend their life doing the work and yet take goods and services from the national storehouse of goods. The heir brings nothing to the storehouse, yet takes from the storehouse. Again, you and I, the makers of goods and services, have to work more and earn less to make up the difference. The argument has been made that the parents of the heir brought units of labor to the national storehouse. True, but the problem is that nothing lasts forever. The work units that the parents brought to the storehouse have disappeared. Food rots in a few days, clothes wear out in a few years, and houses fall down in a few decades. So that leaves the children of the parents taking food, clothing, and shelter from the national storehouse without giving any food, clothing, or shelter in return. Everyday survival is an everyday affair in the here and now. Suppose every child on earth inherited a few million dollars and didn't have to work. Who would grow food? Who would make clothes? Who would build and maintain houses? So once again, it becomes obvious that it's work and work only that provides food, clothing, and shelter. For most of us, inheritance is a moot point anyway. According to one survey, only 22% of people inherit money and for most heirs, the amount is not that big, around 70000 on average. Nice, but not world-shaking. The really big deal is the big inheritance, the multi-million and multi-billion dollar fortunes that perpetuate themselves for generation after generation. These fortunes enjoy everlasting life as they continue to grow ever bigger. As they grow, they concentrate more and more wealth at the top with no end point to stop them. The gap of wealth inequality becomes wider and wider. This process will accelerate as our economy ages. When we read history, we see that inheritance eventually creates a permanent class of loafers who rule over a permanent underclass of serfs. Of such stuff were kings and feudal lords made. For instance, in the old days in England, this process was obvious in the laws of primogeniture, wherein the oldest son inherited the estate and the rest of the kids were out of luck. Thus were the immense noble estates kept intact century after century, and with them the power of the rich landlord over the poor peasants who worked on the estates. Today in the United States, fortunes are usually left to the family as a whole in the form of money along with land. But the effect on the working 99% is the same. We pay so they can play. As we can see, inheritance is the third something for nothing scheme that amasses and preserves fortunes at the top. The solution is simple. Inheritance taxes and gift taxes on wealth in excess of four years of the average cost of living for an adult. In the case of marriage and partnerships, 
The wealth should be returned to society upon the death of the last surviving partner. Thus, money would be recirculated back into society and would help prevent the power of wealth to grow and grow with no end in sight. Uh, one more thing I'll mention and then close, taxes. Government should go cold turkey and operate on current taxes only. No more, no more borrowing, no more government debt. We the people have to pay interest on that debt and the debt burden takes money out of the economy that could go to productive enterprises. Government borrowing along with consumer borrowing also destabilizes the economy by creating an unnatural increase in demand followed by an unnatural decrease in demand. Boom and bust. Borrowing is kind of like a party. Great fun while it's happening. Oh, what a hangover. Secondly, the government would become smaller because it would no longer have to support all the people left behind by the failures of laissez-faire capitalism. The land tax and the inheritance tax would probably supply most of the money that the government would need. If more money were needed, a sales tax could be added. Sales taxes have been criticized for, as being regressive, but if we eliminate poverty, that is no longer an issue. A sales tax is more fair than an income tax because a sales tax determines how much of society's goods are actually worth to the individual. In contrast, income taxes take from employees what is rightfully theirs, 100% of the fruits of their labor. Income taxes discourage the making of goods and the providing of services, which is a detriment to society. We want to encourage work since work is what provides for our survival. Okay, um, I guess we could stop right there. Okay. All right. All right, we're now in the form of questions. I'd like uh, anybody from the uh, audience to uh, go up to the mics if you can, if you have questions. If not, we can uh, get you here. So who has questions? All right. I've got the first question, Marilyn. Okay. Uh, seeing as how our present day system has provided a lot of benefits already for a uh, society, what do you, how, how do you recommend we propose we do all these things that you're talking about? Well, it would be a gradual changeover. You need a gradual changeover because it's, it's kind of hard to separate earned and unearned values at this point. You know, um, I would say maybe a 10 year time period for corporations to, to switch over from inter, uh, investment to lending. And, Probably the same for with land as, as land gets sold instead of being sold, it would be um, the government the government could provide money to help help in the transition with land and inheritance, maybe a 10, 10 year transition period because for a lot of us, you know, we don't have much. So one of the interesting things is that when you think about it, if we were able, if you were to, if the average income in this country were 300,000 for a family four, think of the money that we could save every year, 150,000, that'd be six billion, six million, 10 million, whatever. You know, at the end of 40 years, we could well take care of ourselves and we wouldn't have to worry about leaving money to our heirs um, because they'd be in, in a society where there'd be plenty of opportunities for them. One of the reasons that people are so caught up on inheritance is that they know it's such a rough society right now that they try to leave what they can to their kids to give them a little extra help. But if you have a society where everybody's got a great chance and it's 
you know, the sweat is off and everybody can make it, then you don't have to worry about personally, you know, that we can save up far more uh, in a lifetime than we could ever inherit at this at right Marilyn, now. Marilyn, I'm going to ask you very specifically to keep your answers short and to the point because I'm sure we're going to have more questions and we're going to have a few, quite a few rebuttals. Thank you for speaking tonight. Charlie, you've got the next question. Go ahead. Yeah, Marilyn, you mentioned a company where an employee is fired only if there's two thirds votes uh, to go ahead with that. In those companies, could I file charges? I've had some real mean bosses. Could I bring charges against my boss and then put it to a vote of the employees to have him or her fired? The only way a person could be fired is by two thirds vote of the employees who know their work record, not the all employees in the company, the ones who know the work record. Well, if they mistreat the employees and I file charges against them, and then we have a vote, right? Amongst those who, who know the employee and how he works, yeah. Yeah, the department. So I could fire my boss. Yeah. Good, I like that. Yeah, and you know, that that's one way to keep the bosses responsible to the people they work with instead of brown nosing the guy above them. We could oh, fire the CEO or all of them. Pardon? We could fire the CEO. Be, well, the whole the whole emphasis, everybody would be focused on producing a product that's going to make it in the market. And that's what, instead of it being a personality parade, it will become how can we do the best possible job to, to make a, a widget or a service that people will want to buy? It, you know, it, produce, it puts the emphasis, the incentive on production instead of personality. <clears throat> but don't we have that already in the form of competition? No. Who else has a question? Who else has a question? Okay. Uh, you want to step up to the microphone real quick, if you don't mind? Uh, or, yeah, because it's just the mics are up there. That's why. All right. Let's let's go. Uh, this is a question about person, uh, famous people. Uh, there was an impressive number of famous people that uh, supported uh, this theory. Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 Henry George. Henry George. Henry George, right? Okay, now there was a contemporary, I believe, of these famous people, like Woodrow Wilson and other people. His name was uh, Vladimir Lenin, and he wrote uh, volumes of 55 volumes of books. I never read one of them, but just to know, what did he say about this theory of Henry George? If you said anything. What, I, what did he say about what? I'm sorry, it's, it's kind of difficult for me to understand what people at the podium say. Okay, uh, he's asking. Oh, what did Lennon write about? This? What did Lennon write about this stuff? He wrote 55 books. Do you know anything about his writings and what your theories are? Lennon? Yes. No. We don't know don't anything. anything about Lenin, other than, you know, popular press. As a corollary, have you ever read the Communist Manifesto? No. Or uh, Das Kapital? My dad's the one who came up with these and he read it. Okay. Well, um, about the theory of, uh, I have a question. Go right ahead. I have a question. Do you, do you believe in the minimum wage set by the government, or is that some uh, okay. thing that isn't really necessary and people can do what they want? Well, it's not necessary because if, if, if within each company 
the employees get the profit. Whatever the company makes, that's what the employees get. There's nowhere else for it to come from. Uh, Tim, yeah, I, I have that. Go right ahead. Uh, Maria. Okay, we can't hear you. You must have a. Uh... See, really, in, in a co op, there is no wage, it's just splitting the profits. Wages are kind of an artificial concept. So, thank you. Go ahead, Raj. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Raj. Okay. Okay, society create society people created a business and they give business license to meet their needs of goods and services and uh, to facilitate that. Raj, are you still there? We, we, we lost your connection, Raj. That and it hired the people to help him to serve the society. From his business. Raj, you're still coming in kind of choppy, so just repeat your question. Understand that? I don't get me. Your 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 network bandwidth is low. Can you ask it again, Raj? Raj, you froze up. I'm sorry about that. Uh okay, uh Charlie, go ahead. I guess Roger's bandwidth is low and he, he kind of faded out. Roger, you faded out for a minute or two. I'm sorry, but they just were not getting. Okay, Charlie, you got another question. Go ahead. Yeah, I, the land that my house is on, the last time I believed that it was vacant land was 1890. And does that mean if I wanted to sell this place, I could sell the house value, you said. But would the value of the land be based on the price that it was in 1890? No, whatever whatever the value is now. You're saying that's not allowed to go up. Well, Therefore, the price would be set at whatever it was purchased at in 1890. I didn't say the value would not allow to be go up. That's not what I said. The value goes up as you know the town bills and and people population increases and so it, when you're uh renting it uh, establishing a land rent it would have to be bid it would be open market bidding well so i'm a little confused if i buy an acre of land for a hundred dollars do i have to sell it for a hundred dollars you don't buy it you do not buy it you simply you simply rent it in a sense, but it's it's a land it's a I don't know what you call it, a land grant maybe it's you know it's it's yours to to keep as long as you pay the the uh, land tax on it, but you don't buy it. It's not bought and sold. You simply establish a, a land grant claim as long as you pay the the uh, land rent on it. So there's no private ownership of land. No, but it would still be under under control, under individual control, just like it is now. It would not be like you know, Russia did, where they, you know, I mean, they just botched it totally. It was still read if you read Henry George, it would be under individual control. It's just that it wouldn't be bought and sold. You just establish. I don't know what you'd call it, rights to, to occupancy rights, as long as you pay the land rent, you've got occupancy rights. Okay, Raj, go ahead. Uh, hello, again, looks like something is not right. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you, Raj. Uh, my question I asked was this. The society created a business to meet its needs of goods and services. Business was created so their society get what it wants for its living and services it wants. Do, do, what you are saying is that the business is created 
to serve the employees and not the people at large. Can you answer this, please? What I'm saying is business, a business is created to, to create a product or service that would be, in, would be in demand by society. And the profit from that business would go to the employees. And the employees would be very interested in providing a good product and service to society so the society would want it. So it so, serves, so what? It, serves okay, both, it serves both employees and society. But what about me? If I started a business, I borrowed money, I invested, I took the risk, and uh, I, I, decide, I, I have a knowledge to buy goods and services I can deliver to people at large. So what is my compensation? For all if, their services. If it's ten, if it's uh, ten people or less, you you decide how you want to do it. But the way but, a company really grows, I'm talking about a company that grows beyond ten people. Then it's not just you doing it; you're depending on these other employees to help it grow. But, but what it, about? That's where it comes in that you know, you're as dependent on them as they are on you. It's a team a, effort at that point. After it gets beyond I mean, 10 people, it's a team effort. But what about, what about my initiative, my risk of, I borrow from somebody and I'm paying him the team. Even you are, you are, you are worse than Karl Marx. Karl Marx will give me a view of my, my initiative, my risk taking, my investing my money, my investing my time and energy, and my my hiring employees, my my promising the people the, the goods and services, and uh, leading that whole enterprise. So do I get anything for, the, what do I get? What is my compensation for all that thing and all for my brain? I have brain power. I do not have physical power. I do not, let's see, let's say that I do not have a physical ability, but I have lots of mental and mental capability, like uh, Bill Gates, okay, Elon Musk. They have mental capacity. So, what about value for that that particular thing? Other people have mental ability too, and that's how your company grows. It's not just you when your company gets big. So, so I, I get nothing for that. Starting a company, borrowing a money and promising investors compensation for their money giving to me. They're taking a risk. I may go bust. You're I get nothing. Equal, you're equal to the workers. So if there are 11 workers and one, and you're the leader, there'll be 12 people at the table dividing up the profits. Is that right, Marilyn? That's true. But I will say this, you will have rated, it, Every com just like companies do now, you rate who's contributing what. Some people do contribute more than others, so they get more in return. You still have a rated fair share according to what you've contributed. So what is my fair share for creating the enterprise, doing all those things, using my brain to manage it, to using my brain to create a custom, getting customers to my business, Okay, and uh, taking a risk society and satisfying the politicians and the manager, manager, managers of the society. What do I get for that? Well, that would How be much up, more I get. That's up to you and, and all the people working with you. You decide, you know, what, what your, uh, it's a mutual decision who's contributing what. So do I, do I have to ask my employees how much I should get paid? Well, most most times they have a human resources department or something that kind of decides, but it, it's up to you all to decide. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, that. right, okay that's, that's how business runs right now. Okay, Thank you. Raj, we got another question. Go ahead. Yeah, Raj, let me answer the question uh, with the words of uh, Engels. He explained that the books that you as a talented person you already are worded 
by your talents. So when it comes to monetary rewards, according to Marxism, you should be paid less. People who are less talented are supposed to be compensated more in money because you are already talented in talent and you are oh, they need it's to work out as a was there a question there? I, I couldn't hear what was being said. Uh, Who's got the next question? I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. As soon as I keep this guy muted here, we'll be all awful. What happened? I read the play, Stewie. She read the play, now? Yes. yes. And it was brilliant. Yes, but I've never read any. All right, go ahead. What would the role of the investment community, the stockholders, what is their voice in this corporation? Because businesses flourish through investment. The CEO can be fired, but by the stockholders. It's they who have built up these great corporations, not just an owner. Well, uh, if, if if a stock, if, well, first of all, you don't have stock. I guess you can call it stock, but it's interest-bearing stock. If somebody had something they wanted to say to the company, they could ask, you know, request a meeting. But most most uh, stockholders don't know anything about the company or running the company. It's the employees that know how to run the company. All right, who's next? And it's really the employees who build a company up. They perform the labor. The investors don't. The stockholders don't perform any work. Any They don't put any human energy into it. All they put into it's money. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was diverting to being, I was diverted here. All right, who else has a question? Anybody else? Charlie, go ahead. Yes, uh, Marilyn, let me get my picture up there. Yes, Marilyn, now if a public transit system wants to build a subway, they can borrow money in order to build it. Now, according to your presentation, or no, if I want to, let's begin this way. If I want to, improve my house i can go and borrow money <laughs> and then have the work done and then pay off the loan now you now the government does you're saying does the same thing if they want to build a subway line they borrow money and then as it's built and so forth they pay off the loan and you're saying that's not going to be allowed how in the world would they improve the infrastructure they would have to what like have a save money for years you know what I mean what raise taxes and and save it or something like to build a subway line absolutely that could be like 10 years while we're waiting and it's nothing being done well uh if people really wanted it then they would probably vote to tax you know put money in the pot raise some taxes to do it one thing about it once we've got money circulating at the bottom instead of the top there'll be a lot more money around for us to do the things we want to do both privately and in the community sure. if, you know, if, we're, if we're if the average income the median if the median income it's 300,000 a year for the average family of four. There's money to, you know, everybody can say, okay, let's everybody put in 10, 15,000 and build that subway. It's there. So according to you, there'd be no infrastructure projects unless there was money. The government already had money somehow, someplace. I don't know where. And then they made an appropriation. Well, actually, what they would have to do is go to the people and say, you know, we need a subway. So are you all willing to put up some money to build it? 
right here and now. Yes, yeah, save up for it. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't take that long. You're thinking of the present day uh, society where all of us are so strapped for money, you know, $10 extra dollars in taxes hurts. But if the median income is 300,000 a year, people would say if they felt, first of all, they would take a really hard look. Do we really need this subway? And if they decide they want it, then they'll come up with the, they'll have the money to come up for it, to come up with it. The government doesn't have a bank. They don't have their no. own bank. No, that's what I said. The tax that, you know, they'll levy a tax or whatever it is to, to build the, the subway. All right. All right, who's next? Any other questions? Who else? All right, we, can we go to, uh, all right, Marilyn, you'll get the last word. We're gonna go to rebuttals now. And uh, who's got rebuttals tonight? All right, let's, let's thank him. All right, uh, Marilyn, just go back. We're gonna give you each, each rebuttal about five minutes or so. Our first guy who's gonna go here is uh, Jonathan. And uh, Jonathan, go about your uh, poetic artistic uh, rebuttal. All right. Thank you, Marilyn. Very nice talk. A dram dramatist and democratic <laughs> once said, idiots are always in favor of inequality of income. <laughs> are always in favor of equality. So, okay, thanks. Wow. That's what we're talking about tonight. So there aren't haves and have nots where there's a big ladder. There's a circle, a circle where everybody gets a place at the table. Now, it sounds like when we're really young at the beginning of our development, that's the structure of our educational process. We are, uh, K through 12 curriculum says that everybody's a part of a big circle, ideally. Ideally, I say, okay? There's no such thing as a perfect system. Uh, wage stagnation. If you look at the charts that you can find online where productivity has gone to over 200%, over 250%, maybe up higher than that, this is a, 10 year old graph that I saw online this week, and where hourly compensation has gone. Um, if you're a critique of what Marilyn just presented, that's fine. Uh, I respect, I don't question people's motives, but if you say that capitalism has been a success, uh, just go online to any one of these things, and it shows that workers are being treated like less than nothing based on hourly compensation compared to productivity. Productivity goes way higher than workers' compensation. It's just a fact. So I don't know how people who say that capitalism is a wonderful success can uh, make that claim. That seems to me to be a pretty uh, strong indicator that we should go towards what is known in the Scandinavian countries as democracy combined with, and I know it's a boogeyman term to say in the United States still in 2023, I don't understand why, but combined with of the people, by the people, for the people, sharing. Okay, there's another word for that, socialism. Oh, I said the S word. Shame on me. But Scandinavian countries. But you can also world. call that humanism. You could also call that peace on earth, goodwill towards allism. You could also call that the antithesis of greedism. You could call that whatever religion you are, all the prophets say, why don't we make sure that the least of our brothers and sisters can have a quality of life? So Go ahead, call it Jesusism if you want to. I uh, have heard a lot of convincing arguments, some of them at the College of Complexes over the years, that Jesus was, sorry to say the S word again, a democratic, I always preface it with democratic in front, 
socialist, so kind of like a Scandinavian democracy advocate. Uh, this is an interesting study from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They say that $19.40 is a required hourly wage for one person who has zero dependence to be able to have a survival quality of life that meets the basic living costs for the following essential needs, housing, nutritional food, clean water, which is a big deal in the Chicagoland area. They have never told us how much lead is in the water, and that's why I don't trust Illinois politicians, especially Chicagoland politicians when it comes to water quality. Uh, phone. I can hear it. I can hear it. Turn off the turn on the mic. It's not working. Jonathan can't hear you. I Tim, can't hear either. Fix the mic. at all, and yet you'll find people in the United States Congress with their hair on fire saying, oh my God, all these businesses are going to go I get all kinds of things. Oh, all these businesses will have to treat their workers as people who deserve a life of dignity. You know, you might have to make an adjustment. You might have to move out of the big house into a condominium or an apartment instead. And if you're a business owner that doesn't like the sound of that, well, I'm sorry, that's what a lot of workers today don't have. They're sleeping in tents underneath the bridges, some uh, uh, routes that we go by to get to tonight's uh, free speech forum every Saturday. We see these tents more and more communities all over the Chicagoland area. Now, why is that? Because capitalism is a failure. That doesn't mean that I advocate for any of the other failures of history. We've suffered a lot of fools of economic failure. And you can go down the list, communism, fascism, feudalism, whatever, but we need democracyism. And I don't see anybody in positions of power ever wanting to listen to the ordinary everyday people to present our principles of what our vision would be for democracyism. And that's why we're in the trouble that we're in when it didn't trickle down and it won't trickle down and everybody has yet to cite an example where on earth it has trickled down and i'm very happy about the organizing efforts of people all across the country to suggest that we can do much better this is america uh, we could have the best economic system in the world uh, in my humble opinion i would like to cast my vote for what's known as Scandinavian Scandinavian style democracy or democratic socialism. Thank you to Speaker Marilyn for a great talk. Okay. I'm available. I'm gonna, all right. I'm gonna you want to go next, Raj? I can go if nobody else is there. Oh, I'm about ready to do mine and then we'll let you go, okay? Okay. Right. I'm gonna I'm 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 sitting here because I'm gonna play a quick quick primer on you guys on capitalism who don't really know about what the benefits are and what it does. It's, mm -hmm. it's about three minutes long and I'll make a little comment afterwards. Go ahead, Tim, go ahead. We've right. seen this three times. Well, Charlie, again, sometimes you may have seen it three times, but it's my time for rebutting and uh, you're gonna listen to it again because obviously you don't get it. So we're gonna play it one more time and we're gonna do this real quick at full screen. Why do we show it every week at the start? We don't we show it every week at the, start, at the start, Charlie. Okay, here we go. Oh, it. Now, will somebody explain why the elves have returned yet? But I want to stay in business. How can I do it? Business? Well, let me explain it this way. A manufacturer 
who sticks to old equipment cannot compete and must fail. To survive, he must persuade people to risk savings in his business. He can then buy new equipment, increase production, and show a profit. And he keeps the profit. Oh no, that's what a lot of people think. But he doesn't. Out of profit, he must pay dividends to investors. Profit must be put back into the business to buy newer and better machinery. Spend his profit on machinery? Oh, when does it all end? It never ends. Constant replacement with the weightless machinery makes the industry more efficient, thus enabling it to pay as higher wages and still make a profit. This efficient operation also results in more goods of better quality and produces them at a lower cost to everyone. By thunder, if that's the way it's done, I'll do it. At last. Now watch, Sylvester. And pay attention. Fifty years ago, the standard of living was low. People worked long hours for little pay. But because people anyway, I think you guys. I think, okay, I'm going to stop screen sharing. I think you guys got the idea. Business is running well. It's participating well. We have a good high standard of living. Savings we use to back good ideas gotta, and industry plowed back earnings, new products appear. All right, I think we got just made my rebuttal. But the point of the matter is, is that you see business is running. And what a lot of people forget is the slim profit margins that businesses run on anyway. And what happens when that business loses money? Do the employees take the same hit when the business goes bankrupt? Do those employees go bankrupt? No, in a lot of cases, they move on and get better jobs. All right, I've said my say on why capitalism works. I think Elmer Fudd did a decent job on explaining it. So uh, go ahead and let's see where you guys come up with next. Yeah, All okay. right. Who's next? Okay, I'm going. Okay. All right, Raj, you're next. Marilyn, you you have a novel idea of uh, doing good to the society, but the plan you are presenting is time has gone. Maybe maybe hundred years back, maybe hundred and fifty years back, and. Uh, the society in a way it runs and what you are talking about $300,000 income and that income is there because society is working. The, the average, average employee is making money. Lots of employees are making lots of, lots of money than they will ever make under your system. People are doing well. They do not have a problem about income. The, the, they can get a job that pays ever more than before. What problem we have is inflation. What problem we have is wars, like how government is spending. So we are going to build a new society. We have to solve our internal problem and our external problem that we can make more money and we can have more resources and more happiness if we just uh, try to be nice to everywhere in the world instead of fighting with everybody, instead of arguing with everybody, instead of finding a fault with everybody. But as far as the economy is concerned, we are doing pretty good. Democrats as well as Republicans. Of course, not everybody is happy, everybody wants more, but we are doing good. The black community, they are doing good. They are not complaining as much. You know, and uh, we have a people lining up at the border 
and they want to work because they know they can make the money and they can get the job. So I do not know what you are talking about. And uh, you need to do your work. And you were, you were asked that, uh, okay, you tell us how it, your system will work. And you did not reply to it, you know? And so, so well, anyway, I, I, I don't think I enjoyed because it wasn't, your presentation wasn't rational, did not make a sense in the real economy and the real world. But I thank you for coming and giving us your ideas. I'm done, Tim. Okay, uh, Ernie, you're gonna go next and then we'll go with Charlie. Okay, Ernie, you're next. Unmute, Ernie. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Ernie. I could go last because actually uh, I just got in and I didn't hear the presentation, but I have some comments based on what uh, Jonathan said. And so I can do it now. You want me to do it now? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Well, uh, and when I read about the talk, I think I'm probably very sympathetic with it. Um, and uh, Jonathan, I think you were mixing apples and oranges. I liked what you said. Uh, but I think you were mixing apples and oranges. You were mixing political systems and economic systems, and they're different. And there is a tendency for democracy to be more with with free market type systems and and authoritarian governments with with more socialists although there's a blend every country is a blend i think we had this conversation last week uh there are no purely socialist countries left i don't believe and there are no purely communist and there are no purely market driven economies anymore even china has become very much a mark uh uh which was communist has become market driven in many ways in many ways. And um, I agree that there has to be an interplay. The most successful countries have an interplay. They have a good uh, free market uh, system and they also have good social services, safety net, they take care of their people. And this is why I think why the Scandinavians are so successful is because they have both. They have a good, uh, uh, they cover the bases as far as the safety net and making sure people get what they need. But on the other hand, they have a lot of successful corporations and businesses. And oh, by the way, the reason I'm late, uh, I went to hear the Eurovision finals. I don't know if you all know what that is. It's a song contest. And in addition to Jonathan liking the Scandinavian country, so did the, uh, the judges and the voters at Eurovision. Sweden won. And there were and Norway and Finland were both in the top five. So they're doing good in the song song contest as well as in the economic area of life. They're but happy. Uh, they have something to sing about. What's that? They're happy people. They have a lot to sing about. They do. Yeah, uh, they're they're highly taxed, but they they're they are not uh, against the taxes because they feel they get their money's worth. So anyway, basically, that's what I wanted to say. I'm going to try and read the or listen to the presentation on a recording i hope it'll be available i know it'll be and, available. Uh, then i can make more comments thank okay. you all right uh charlie you had something to say next go ahead yeah first of all let's uh, i'd like to thank marilyn for a very very well thought out presentation and i enjoyed it and learned a lot i'm going to cover four areas i'll be very specific I'm not really an economist. However, I believe Henry George is an economic system in which the value of the dollar is based on land. That made a great deal of sense in the 19th century when it was written. I don't think it has any relevance, however, to the international economy that exists today. The value of the dollar today is based upon the value and the solidity of the American economic system. And that's what it's rooted on. Uh, land reform is what you're talking about. It's been tried specifically in countries such as the Soviet Union, China, and even in the Great, Great Britain in England. Uh, in monarchical systems, uh, I believe it's generally held that the monarch is in fact the title holder 
to all the land in the nation. Um, so land reform, uh, I'm not certain if it's particularly necessary today. Land is in fact being acquired by agribusiness at an alarming rate, um, but I'm not certain if that can be curtailed. Okay, that's the land issue and Henry George. Number two, I always like to take something home with me from a meeting of the college complexes. And you said something there that if an employee doesn't like the conditions of employment where they're at, they're often told, well, just quit. We hear this from the libertarian type individuals or free market individuals, oh, <laughs> just quit. And you said it, you, something that was terribly, 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 so vitally true was that you're just trading places. So you give up one bad place of employment and you trade it simply for another one <laughs> and another one and another one because in fact, they're all bad places to work. Well, Thank you for that thought. Number three, um, anything in the system I see lacking in it. Now I gave a lecture on the personage of Robin Hood. And what I did not see in your system, that perhaps you could add to it, is a thing called implementation. And what I think needs to be done to really correct all the mistakes that have taken place, which you pointed out quite well, is, and I often come post on the uh, an equitable distribution of wealth in this nation. There's tremendous inequitable distribution of wealth and we must implement a system to take from the rich and give to the poor. I don't really care how it's done. I think it should be simply be conscripted, give them about a two or a couple day notice that uh, the wealth that they have accrued was not done appropriately and therefore it become the property of the state and the people to which it originally belonged because as you said a number of times, it is labor that creates all wealth. Not really. And the really. people have it. Now, last of all, Ernie, these thinking of having binary systems is a system like saying, well, we're going to have, we're going to allow a little bit of exploitation, but that's okay. No, sir. Exploitation is not to be fostered or encouraged or allowed with the injustice of one is the injustice of all. And to say, well, we're gonna allow, any, we point out that capitalism is exploitative and ruinous to the economy. <coughs> and you and you come on and say, well, let's, uh, let's have 50% of it. That's the best system. No, sir, the best system is where you do not have one with exploitation. Thank you very much. Marilyn, please work on the next one. Looking forward to it. And thank you for speaking to the college, at least by myself personally. Thank you. Okay, you're next. Go ahead. Greed is good. Greed works. You got that from a movie. <laughs> <laughs> These land reforms have failed. They've caused famines in the Ukraine and in Zimbabwe. Capitalism, if you think it's bad, it's still better than anything else. The investor, it was have fostered growth. In that film that you had trouble with, yeah. they explained the, the importance of the investor class. Yep. The importance. If, go ahead, I'm sorry. Without Wall Street, they have funded all your public works projects. These municipalities are funded to raise money they do for municipal bonds. Without capitalism, the whole system would collapse. I'm going to pick up the comments. I like that news. You see, Charlie, the mystery of capital is and capital. And when and you and you had your chance, pal. Sit down. Yeah, yeah I know, but I'm going to say you showed your cartoon. You're done. When you have capital, 
and capitalism. Capital is what makes capitalism work. You see, I can tell you right now that my name is worth something. You see, this isn't me, but Very it represents nice. me. Well, it's going to bring it out the big guns. And, it, and it goes, basically what it says, Charlie, is that I can go in, slap it down, and based on my ability to pay, buy something. You, and that's exactly what capitalism does. It gives you a sense of value and what you can do and buy and sell. And there's a, something called a price mechanism that keeps prices down. And something called competition that keeps people kind of honest. But I also know too that competition may produce the worst in people, but the best in products. All right. Kill the rabbit. Kill the rabbit. Kill the rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who's next? All right, David, you're going. Then we'll let you get right after him. All right. Knock it out of the park, Dave. Knock it out of the park, Dave. <laughs> well, well, actually, I'm going to be brief. It's my understanding that the public supermarket is owned by somebody who's a Trump supporter. That's number one. Well, that sucks. Yeah. And then <laughs> making us very popular is among the people who endorse the important idea. Well, Mr. P Dr. Butler is the president of Columbia University. I don't think he ever backed Adolf Hitler, but he was an early supporter of Mussolini in the 20s and 30s, and a lot of right wing intellectuals decided that fascism was the way the future that Mussolini had made on the train. Okay. So you're saying, gosh, it's good. Why don't you go next and then we'll let Andy go, okay? Oh, and I'm forgetting your name, so. I... Oh, well, anyway. All right, let's. Uh... I, I want to make sure everybody sits down. The thing's almost in my chart, you. Go ahead. Do you think it's not working? The reason is. Uh, in the last six months or so after I became 85, I'm thinking of uh, what is the cause of the discontent and the unhappiness and uh, the sense of uh, uh, unfulfillment uh, in our country. You know, in the last uh, two, three hundred years, I go back to the founding fathers. These perfidious, uh, rebellious Englishmen rebelled against the greatest country in the world at that time, the glorious British Empire. And you know, what did they produce? These, the leaders and uh, anti-democratic people, if you don't believe it, read uh, an economic interpretation of the Constitution by Charles Kirby. I think it was written around 1900. Okay. And all these guys created the system that we have today. It was a system that was for the top 10% at the expense of the bottom 90%. That's why 90% yeah. of Americans are not happy and do not have a sense of fulfillment because this was done not by accident or it was done with premeditation and malice of forethought to maintain a slaveocracy in the United States, which these guys planned to do it once they got liberated from England because the English were going to abolish the slave trade about 1810. So these uh, perfidious English. Uh, uh, unsavory characters that we idolize and we canonize and we, it's whatever they wrote, they, we consider it like as holy as the Bible. Well, these guys were very selfish, very elitist, and we, I think, are victims of their lives. And we have to abolish the Constitution that these slave owners created. We have to make a Constitution that will be Majoritarian, not minoritarian. And they talk about all men are created equal. These guys were lying bastards. They didn't believe in the quality. And um, what happens is, I, I, I'm sorry that we lack real political uh, maturity even 150 years later. 
to realize that we have been uh, exploited from the day that this nation was established. Now, this beautiful country is a beautiful country, the people are beautiful, but we are victims of these uh, perfidious English rebels, the founding fathers. So we gotta go back to something that is more English, more Canadian, and more Australian. And this is what I'm gonna finish with. We have to abolish the slave owner constitution and let's go to England. They don't have a constitution, but the Englishman has more rights than we ever had and will ever have for our grandchildren will ever have. They have free medical care, people who live longer, they're happier, they're healthier, and they live in a civilized society. <laughs> We live in a civilized society. I mean, 10, 20,000 people are murdered every year with these guns in this country. This is, this is not democracy. This is not this is a, a respectable country that we ought to pledge our allegiance to. We ought to go back to Alexander of Macedonia. And I'm finishing with this because I went to Greek school when I was 10 years old. And he, went to conquer Asia and there was a boring and not and people were working for years to figure out how to uh, uh, unleash a boring and not and what he did he took out a sword and he cut it and that's how the grand of the great now I don't know if that great it was just another um uh, uh, say imperialist uh guy that sort of was but the thing is, that's what we ought to do. We ought to liberate ourselves from the slave owner constitution. Yeah. The time to do it is now. Very nicely said. Okay, Andy, go say. ahead. I thank Marilyn for her speech tonight. I thought she made a lot of good points. She's talking about what a society could become if we deal with the problem first. So <clears throat> when your house is burning down, you can't talk about uh, shopping for a fireproof paint at Home Depot that you might paint the house with in a day or two. Yeah. You got to deal with the fire or the house is gone. Today, language matters and using proper language means using, telling people what's actually happening. If you have, for people that are religious, you look at the principles of what Jesus taught. Today, our country is divided into what I call pro-Christ Christians that believe in the teachings of Jesus and your anti-Christ Christians that do just the opposite. They call themselves Christians, but don't help the sick, let them die. Don't help the poor. Roll your wheelchair off into a cul culvert and just die. Uh, I got my billions and I'm keeping them. If Jesus was here today, he would be considered a progressive. He'd be sure right he there with AOC and a hundred other <laughs> people that are risking their lives every day when they're getting laughed at by other people that think Trump was a good president. Language matters. The floodgates are about to open, people. A lawsuit is just one that you haven't heard about. Trump filed a $50,000 lawsuit against a former aide, a woman, because she had the canary to speak out about how he was abusing women and aides and everything else during the time she uh, worked in the White House and stuff. Well, it's a couple of law firms backed her, and they won. They declared the non-disclosure agreement, NDA, unconstitutional. So all the other people that worked in the Trump administration, especially women, hundreds of them, are considered, they're, they're, they're not under the, uh, the non-disclosure. They can come out, and they're beginning to come out. They're just coming out of the woodwork and saying, Trump is a bully, a coward, a liar, a thief, and he's an abuser of women, among other things. Language matters between you got here circling Earth on an alien spaceship and you had no 
concept of what our politics is. You just looked at what was happening the last few years. You would say, well, look at that. Between 2016 and 2020, there was no president in the United States. They had no president. They had a corporate criminal, a psychopathic, sociopathic, corporate criminal with no redeeming values, no qualities to be the president, all kinds of qualities that should have landed him in jail within 72 hours because he's in the Oval Office. Bill Rockstrow coined the best term. He said, the presidency is a suit and we, we elect somebody to fill the suit. Well, for the four years Trump was in, that presidential suit was filled by a bloated, bloviating, two-legged toxic waste dump in the shape of an ugly human. <laughs> And that's the best that can be said about it. And, and, you look, and look at what, you know, our country is divided right now between people who know the reality of what the Trump years were like and people that don't know. There, we have a lot, a lot of kind, decent people that got sucked into the cult. They have the cult of Fox News. They, they believe things that aren't real. Fox News is used as a teaching tool by universities all over the country now to teach students, journalism students, this is how you do pro good propaganda. This is how you lie to people and make it look like news. And of course, Fox News just had to shed Tucker Carlson, not for the big crime of bloviating lies all the time. Tucker cost him money. He cost him almost $800 billion for slandering Deep, like, what was it, Deep Open Machines? Uh, what's that company? Dominion, Dominion Voting Systems. Dominion. Dominion. Dominion, okay. So, as people get out of the cult of Trump, they find out that the United States has changed a lot since 1973. We had, in the, uh, the Eisenhower years, we had the same kind of social democracy, more or less, that they have in Finland and Norway right now. We had affordable health care. We had affordable education. Norway doesn't have normal prisons. They have uh, a different kind of sort of justice system. They don't have mass shootings over there, basically. Finland has no homeless problem. They don't even know what homeless people are. If someone doesn't have a home, they give them a home. Now, you know, they find them a home and subsidize. It's like the roads are subsidized. They, they, they consider if you're going to deal with some of these mental health issues, you first get them indoors. They found they found out that it's cheaper to provide a home for people than it is to treat them like on this. Uh, we have mental illness, uh, hospitals, emergency plans, all kinds of stuff dealing with homeless people in America. When it would be cheaper if we just put them in apartments or you know, temporary housing until they could get permanent jobs and everything else. Tom Hartman has been writing for the last few months, but the last couple of weeks, he's got a couple of good articles that will show up on Common Dreams. Tom Hartman incidentally has the most popular talk show, radio talk show in the country. Yeah. He's on from 2, I think it is, 820 on 8.20 a.m. from here, and he's on Sirius XM. I'll give you him all over the country, but the rest of the radio is right wing. So his articles are it's time to say it. The Republican <coughs> Party is the party of death. It's death and destruction. That's all he believes. And as I said, language matters. We keep talking, referring to these people as senators and congressmen. Well, in the Republican Party, they're not senators and congressmen. They're wholly owned intellectual prostitutes owned by the billionaire predator pimps that pay them to do evil shit. And they have... In 1980, basically in 1980, an invisible neon sign went up over the White House. For people that could see it and read and interpret it, it said, if you have no ethics, no morals, and no conscience, and you're willing to take money from billionaire predators to change America into a fascist country, and, uh, get rid of the middle class, create a, a, a philosophy of death, come on down, we got a job for you. And it's likewise, right next to that, it says, if you have ethics, morals, and a conscience, if you, if you think you were elected by the people to provide you know, decent things for them, get out of the Republican Party. We don't like this kind. And that's where we are today. We have, 
we have one political party in this country. That's that's basically one big political party. That's the Democratic Party, and almost half of it is what we call progressives. The Republican Party is a conglomeration of criminals masquerading as elected politicians. And I'm looking at you, Kristen Cinema. You want to see a de dictionary definition of intellectual property? Look up what Joe Manchin is doing. Yeah. And Kristen Cinema taking money from the pharmaceutical industry to kill things that would help people. Oh, it's just you know, it's a party of death, and we're we're headed toward we're headed toward the cliff in 2024. If somebody like Trump gets elected, then no no Democrats will ever be elected again. They're they're passing laws right now in major cities, major blue cities, so to make it virtually impossible for Democratic college students and all kinds of other Democratic people to vote. And we they can't beat us at the polls, so you say, well. We're going to make it impossible for the world. So they're getting rid of voting uh, polling machines and voting drop boxes in Democratic areas, and they're putting more of those boxes in Republican areas. They're making it easier for right-wing MAGA Republicans to vote with no problem when we outnumber them by three to one. The quarter of this country believes in insane shit. MAGAs. And make America great again. Language matters. And I tell, I'll tell anybody in their face, if you, if you support Donald Trump, you got to love the pedophile priest. You got to support him too, because it's the same moral and ethical category you're in. Okay. But most most Americans think that pedophiles shouldn't be messing with our kids. You do that, That's 90, 95%. But they don't know that Trump is in that class. Once hmm. they learn, once you learn about your priest, you can't support him anymore. Well, this is where we are with educating people that are supporting Trump. And the floodgates are open right now with women coming out saying, well, sleeve ball. Well, sleeve ball is, that's too mild a term. It, it, it's just, you can't, there's, there's almost no language to describe Trump. He's at the bottom of the toxic waste barrel. And, and, we, and the media, the media told us for four years, he's the president, he's the president. I say, Donald Trump and Joe the plumber. Make Joe the plumber put a white coat on him and put him as, make him the head of brain surgery at Mount Sinai. <laughs> <laughs> we could see through that, right? Well, Donald Trump had the same kind of con concept for his job okay. as Joe Trump. No qualifications at all. And that's the last thing I'll say. Okay, Marilyn, I'm going to let you have the last word on mute. You'll get the last word here at the college tonight before we... Uh... Thank her again. Excellent presentation. Okay, Marilyn, uh, go ahead. Um. I think there are some interesting, very interesting comments made. I guess what I was trying to say with, with what I was saying is that uh, no matter what, what you call your system, if there's larceny in it, if there's um, the ability of one, of one person to live off the labor of another, it's going to fail no matter, no matter what the ism is. Um, this economic democracy is dedicated to the idea that if we stop trying to live off of each other's labor, we can eliminate poverty and we can provide economic stability for everybody. We have a good, that in turn will bring about peace within our own society and eventually the world. If we become a society where everyone, everyone can truly prosper, people of other countries will demand the same economic justice. When we look at any conflict in the world today, whether it's within our big cities or outside our borders on other continents, we see economic deprivation and poverty at work. <clears throat> we see people with no jobs and no hope. Basically, we're seeing the people left behind as the wealth centralizes. This happened in every country on earth, no matter what the ism that they were living by, and it's happened throughout history because I guess we're kind of still half in the jungle where we want to live off of each other's labor and be lazy, I don't know. The answer is to change our institutions to provide a truly level playing field that ensures employees receive 100% return for work 
and ensures that everyone has access to the tools of nature, the land, the water, the air, to provide the building blocks for work that provides for our survival. We, almost, we also must ensure that we have all three reforms, corporate reform, land reform, inheritance reform. If we leave just one something for nothing institution in place, it will eventually build up a big pile of money that gives it the power to hire, fire, and bribe everyone else in society and thus destroy that society. Piecemeal democratic reforms have no chance against a tsunami of money. The only answer is to prevent a tsunami. We cannot do that in nature, but economic systems are man-made. We can change economic systems. Economic tsunamis, big pool, in other words, big pools of wealth are of our own making, and thus we have the power to unmake them. So that, I think that's where we have to look for the common thread. The common thread is that we receive 100% return for work and that everybody has access to the tools of nature. Then people can survive, they can support themselves, and we can have a peaceful society. That's, I think, what we need to look for. Okay, Marilyn. Uh, David, uh, go ahead and adjourn us out. All right. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you for Marilyn. So good. I had to run out and take somebody to the ER, and I missed some of it. But you are always on target. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. All right, Charlie. I'm going to switch over the Zoom controls to you, and we'll zoom and out of here. Next week, Jonathan Barton on the International Criminal Court. Thank you all for coming. Have a good night. Okay, Charlie. Okay. All right. Thank you. And recording. Charlie, stop the recording, Charlie. Stop uh, the record. Hit the, hit the stop recording. Me? Yeah, I just made you host. I, I stopped. I forgot to stop it. Where is it? Oh, hang on. I got it. Oh, shit. Uh, Charlie, we just gotta. I'll just, I'll, we're just gonna end it, Charlie. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Just end the session. You're in control now. I'll leave and then go ahead and end it. Charlie, we're gonna have any further conversation. It's over with, Charlie. Oh, there's not. Well, usually there's there's conversation afterwards for those of us who yeah, are left. That's what we're in right now. Oh, okay, good. Okay, good, good, as good, as good. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, there seems there's a lot of us left here, so so that's good. And I'm sorry there I missed go. the presentation, but I will try and find the uh, the tape. Uh, Marilyn, didn't you give this presentation at the Dallas group? Yes, I did. I thought you did. And I missed that one too. And I was going to try and look at it before this, but I just just did not have a chance to do it. Yeah, life gets busy. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't be. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be retired, you know, but somehow <laughs> there's still a lot going on. There is a lot going on in Maryland off the record. How much longer do you think we can survive as a country if we do not make some of these changes that you're calling for that are so obvious to any reasonable person, but we're controlled by greed? Yeah. I don't know. You know, it, it's, it's hard to say. If Trump gets reelected in 24, <laughs> I don't know. You know, hold hold that back, but eventually it's going to collapse. Uh, some way or other, it always does. You look through history; all the nations do eventually implode. 
I don't know, you look at Rome, they say it took several centuries, but might go a lot faster now with, you know, AI and all the computer systems. Yes. Wealth, wealth changes hands so quickly. Right now we're in a situation where three men in the country, Bezos, um, the guy from Omaha and- Buffett, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, and I think it's Elon Musk, maybe, or somebody. They they own, they have as much money as the bottom 60% of the country. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, it's just astounding. And you don't see that really getting addressed anywhere. It's no wonder people are going nuts because we're just all fighting over the crumbs that are getting smaller and smaller. Every group fights over the crumbs. I think that's why Trump is as popular as he is. I think there are a lot of human beings that are just hurting. You know, they don't see any way out. And here comes, <clears throat> here comes Trump, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's just like it was with Hitler. People were so desperate. It's not that any of these people is evil and even Trump, he may have some problems. <laughs> But, and he's done some very evil things. But it's, it's there's just a circumstances are bringing all this together, Marilyn. The money is centralizing and people are getting desperate. Here in Dallas, we're seeing rents $2,000 a month for a one bedroom, 600 square feet. And of course that includes everything, but you know, it starts out like 1450 and they tack on all these amenity charges. And then the man or woman has to contract for electricity. So it turns out, you know, maybe 1800 if they're lucky. And they're too small, really, for more than one person. But they say now in Dallas, you need three minimum wage earners living together to pay for a one month's rent. Wow. Huh. And nobody's, you know, you can't get any, anybody to really address it or the, uh, under, the underlying wealth inequality or anybody to criticize the way the wealth is funneled to the top. Here, I, you know, we're, I'm coming up with the, you know, these ideas about how the, the money should go to the people who actually create, create the goods and services. But you don't hear anything about that in, in the popular press. Well, you know, agencies like Housing Forward, they know uh, they know that uh, that probably that probably they do know that we need a redistribution of wealth, but they hesitate to say things that are coming.